this last open lecture, the last open lecture of uh, 2017, and we are going out with a bang, with a bang. <laughs> don't know how I phrase that, um, with Howard Johns, who's going to talk to us about climate change, and with COP meeting in Bonn this week, uh, it couldn't be more, more well-timed. So they're probably downstreaming it now to see, <laughs> see what you've got to say and pop it in. So, massive welcome to everybody. We've got 27 Robert Kennedy College students. Can I have a few countries, please? Where are you from? Jordan. Jordan. Germany. Germany. South Africa. Marcus. <laughs> England. Nigeria. Rwanda. Brazil slash Germany. Brazil slash Germany. Australia. Australia via Vietnam. Vietnam. Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi. Ghana via France. Cote d'Ivoire. I'm going to ask some English people and the chipping where you're from. England. Come here or local? Yorkshire. Yorkshire. Yorkshire, okay. Ooh, okay. Did you get your visa stamps? I'll sort that out later. Egypt. Egypt. Kenya. Kenya. Pakistan, USA, and Saudi Arabia. Okay, bye, Apple. Alison, can you tell us welcome? Because we do not have a study correct here. I'm very near to you, Polly. Dave Murphy. Local, all welcome. Uh, Dr. Roy Damari, especially from Robert Kennedy College, he's come from Ger uh, Geneva, and he's a German. Okay, so a uh, big welcome to our last, uh, our tenth of the year, I think, isn't it? Our ten, ten open lectures for ten years in Cumbria. Uh, so you're, you're very welcome indeed. I'm Grace Hurford, module tutor for RKC. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Howard. Um, he does work for a community uh, owned renewable energy mm -hmm. revolution. I, yeah. think, I think revolution rather than company is more accurate, isn't it? But you did found and lead an award-winning solar business. You've written a guidebook. What's the title of your guidebook? For it's called Energy Revolution, Your Guide to Make It Happen. Okay, so you didn't keep it to himself. He's actually sharing the knowledge. He, he Have got one w, copy. Yeah, a W card, not this card. That's our in joke what we're going to be doing. Campaign on energy climate issues in... Uh, Parliament and in tree houses. I, I, yeah. I look forward to that a bit later. Um, he was just an activist saying no to things and then he moved on to building solutions. Um, he is, I think, convinced still that we've got the technology and the money to implement uh, the right climate and energy solutions. Um, you, your company manages hundreds of megawatts of solar power stations around the UK. So when we switch the lights on, Things go down. We can thank Howard at times. Um, Chair of Positive Climate Change Charity 1010. Hopefully, you'll mention a bit more about that. He lives in Sussex and he's got three children aged 11, 6, and 2. So, um, welcome to a good night's sleep in Amherst. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's quite, quite a broad ranging uh, uh, introduction. Thank you. And thank you very much for having me here. Um, I'm just interested to know a bit about you all. Are, are, are you uh, sort of uh, very knowledgeable about climate change? Any hands would say very knowledgeable about climate change? Knowledgeable about renewable energy or the energy sector in general? Okay. So I'm going to be talking about those things, so probably you'll be able to switch off and relax. I, I thought at 5.30 everyone's ready for a, a pint or a sleep or something to go and have a walk. Um, so I'm gonna to have to keep you uh, really busy. So I'm afraid you've got a lot of things to look at. There's not too many words, lots of pictures. I'll probably be talking far too fast. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk in three sections um, and then I'm gonna give you some time to talk to each other in between. So the first section, burning issues is all about climate change. The middle section's about the energy revolution that's going on. And the last section's about communities and how they get involved. So off we go. Way, oh look at that, this does work. So burning issues, I mean, we'll start with this, climate change. I, I first studied climate change in 1993 when I did a degree in energy engineering and environment. Um, it was possibly the most horrific thing I'd ever come across and I didn't know what the hell to do with myself. Um, you know, I, I'm always drawn to this image. It's the first image of the whole of the earth and it's apparently what, it was the starting point for the environmental movement. Um, and when you look at the images from the International Space Station of our planet, it's particularly noticeable how thin the atmosphere is. Uh, you know, there's really not a lot of it that's protecting us on our spaceship as we hurtle through 
this uh, vacuum of space at millions of miles an hour. So my, my first reaction to this whole thing was utter horror. And, and, and I didn't really have the tools to, to, to do anything that intelligent with it. So I decided that the best thing I could do was to put my body in the way of the machine. So um, I actually went and uh, lived in trees for about two years. Um, at the time, my father was a diplomat in Chile. And, he said, and when people said, oh, what does your son do? He's, and he'd say, oh, well, he's, uh, he's currently living in a tree house trying to stop a road being built. They'd say, stop a road being built? Is he mad? We want more roads. Why is he trying to stop them, you know? So I, I, I ended up spending about two years living on various sites, building tree houses, living in trees, uh, being evicted from trees, uh, and trying to stop the progress of the machine with limited success. Was that being climbed? We, we put up walkways between the trees at about 50 or 60 foot up, two ropes, and you walk on one and hold on to the, hold on to the top one. And that way you could protect a, a bunch of trees from being cut down. So that's what we did. And, and I was actually evicted from a tree on an open cast mine site in South Wales, um, where they were digging up the last bit of old growth woodland um, to make way for an open cast mine, which has since been built. So that was my... Sorry? Sorry? No, a big, big group. There was a massive movement across the UK. There, was, there were thousands of people living in the woods doing that at the time. And we all had long hair and, and uh, didn't wash very much. I, I guess for me, you know, when you talk about climate change, people say, well, you can't see it. You know, if, if, if CO2 was red, you know, then the sky had gone red already, we'd be thinking very differently about it. But I love these visualizations. So each ton of CO2 is a 33 meter ball. That's New York. That's one day of New York's carbon to put it in context, you know, to give you the sort of a, a visual perspective of what's going on. I, now, I'm not used to doing this. It's uh, trying to make a film work when I'm doing one of these things, but I just thought it was really useful. And of course, you know, you don't feel the warming, but when you see it mapped, you know, every country in the world, what's happened over the last hundred years, you know, and when you, if, if you know what happens at one degree and two degrees warming in terms of the effect it has on our planet, and it starts to be quite scary. I mean, I'll just let that run. But, you know, it's really tangible. This is happening. So we're trying to limit ourselves to a two-degree world. We haven't got much room. We haven't got much room at all. And actually, what does a two-degree world look like? It doesn't look great. So what's happened to the Arctic in that time? So from 1850s to today... And again, this is a few years out of date. Basically, the Arctic is melting at a, a dramatic rate. Um, now, when, when the sea ice melts in the Arctic, it won't, affect, it won't affect sea level because it's sat on top of the sea. But when this part, the... Uh, where's the pointer thing on this? Oh, there you go. There's an ice shelf sat on there, which is Greenland. When that goes, which it will do following the Arctic you get three and a half metres sea level rise in one hit, basically. Um, and you can see, this is last year, this time last year, temperatures of the Arctic are six degrees higher than they normally would be. So, so you get reinforcement effects on the poles. Because Obviously, where it was white previously, it reflected a lot of the sun's energy back into space. Suddenly, it's blue. It absorbs energy. So you're getting these massive lakes forming on top of the ice caps. They're blue, they're absorbing more energy, so you get this increased effect, basically. It's pretty scary. And then the same in the, in the Antarctic. In February this year, that ice shelf, that, that sort of crack there broke off. Now, for those of you who aren't from this area, Wales is pretty big, a 100 kilometer or 150 kilometer long piece of ice. Now, again, that's sea ice, so it's not affecting uh, sort of um, uh, sea levels. But when you look at the rest of, the, of, of Antarctica, that whole continent is covered in ice. When the continental ice melts, that's six and a half metres sea level rise. You know, if you put that with the, Ant with the Arctic one, you're looking at 11 metres. You know, that civilization completely changed. This is Shanghai in three degrees. It's completely underwater. That's 18 and a half million people displaced. The Nile, Nile Delta, Egypt, 
completely underwater at three degrees. I think that's about five and a half million people. Uh, eight, I don't know, eight million. Is it the Osaka, Japan? That's about five and a half million people displaced. Bangladesh, I dread to think of the numbers there. And, and let's face it, it's already happening in Bangladesh. There are already islands that have gone. There are already, you know, there are already areas that are no longer able to be farmed. You know, this, is, this is unfolding. And then Miami. That's definitely gone at three degrees. And it's, it's probably gone at two degrees. You know, so the, so the, the very deal that our politicians are signing up to you know, is the end of loads of places that people love, that they call home. It's another, another interesting little um, bit of uh, ways to help you understand what's going on. So since 1998, the effect of climate change is like two billion Hiroshima's, Hiroshima bombs being set off in the atmosphere. That's how much energy has been released. Now most of that energy has been absorbed by the sea Something like 80 or 90% of that energy is absorbed by the sea. And the sea drives the weather. Uh, and it drives things like this, which is Typhoon Haiyan, which, uh, uh, what was it, 195 mile an hour winds. Um, it didn't cause that much property damage, I can tell you. Uh, only, only 3 billion property damage, about 8,000 people missing. But, you know, millions of people's homes destroyed across a huge section of Asia. And then you've got a more recent one, Irma. Now this was like 60 billion pounds of property damage this thing caused. Only 130 people killed because you know, they were able to move people around. But you know, there's Miami. It's already underwater. You know, the, the, the city officials in Miami have just uh, gone out with a bond offering to try and raise, I can't remember, $400 million to build flood defences around their city because they know that this is coming. Whatever Trump says, this is coming because it's happening every time there's a high tide. You know, so this, climate change is not something that's going to happen to us. It's happening now. And, you know, I, I'm picking just a real few, a few examples here of, you know, you can look pretty much every day somewhere in the world, there's a climate change related weather event happening that's affecting people's lives. I mean, this is, again, the fallout from, the fallout from, uh, from that last hurricane is that Puerto Rico still has no power, something like two months on. Only 25% of the people there have got power. I think only about 15% have got fresh water. You know, that's, that's dramatic, dramatic for, a, you know, a developed nation. Then across in Europe, you've got fires in, um, this is Portugal. So massive fires across big areas of Portugal. You know, lots of people losing their lives and their homes. And then lo and behold, you have uh, the first hurricane that comes up this far. Now we know it's, it's the first time a hurricane's ever come up that far because actually they built all these clever uh, modeling devices to, to map them and they, they hadn't made it so that they, they could model up into the far reaches of this map because hurricanes never go there. But this one did. It went off the map basically. You know, so this is not, this is not normal weather. This is, this is freak weather happening, and it's being driven by all of that heat that's being released into the atmosphere. And how did that heat get there? Well, there's about 100 companies that were responsible for most of it. Some big names up there that you'll recognize. BP, Royal Dutch Shell. You know, there's nation-state-owned companies like Rosneft and people like that. But basically, there's 100 companies, and the products they've sold that we've all bought that have caused this to happen. And they're going to even more extremes. So right now, um, the oil and gas industry, you know, this, this is the pinnacle. This is tar sands where you're digging up you know, massive areas of, of, of landscape. The tar sands, you know, they're, they're, they're a form of rock effectively. They're bitumen and sand gone solid together. To get it out, you dig it out, then you have to heat it up using natural gas, something like that. And then you get, have to wash it. It's, it's a really toxic process. It creates loads of um, nasty you know, pools of toxic water at the end of it. And it's a you know, it's, it's, it's very, very inefficient way of making, of making energy, basically. But you know, this, this, is, this is where the energy industry is at. This, you know, exploring for oil and gas in deeper waters in the Arctic and fracking. 
which they're trying to push in the UK. And all for this, flick the switch so we can turn the light on. And when you look at that system, nearly 80% of the energy we stick into the, to the energy system is wasted. So in our conventional power stations in the utility system, you know, 60, over 60% 60 goes up the chimney as waste heat. You know, that, that is criminal, surely. And, and funnily enough, that is mirrored in the transport system and, uh, and, and the sort of heat, heat system, so buildings. So, you know, a lot of us are pumping heat into our buildings, they're not efficient, and the heat's just going straight out through the roof and windows. You know, when you put oil into your car, you know, your engine's, what, 30, 40% efficient? Most of it's waste heat. You know, so... We, we have a problem. And the juxtaposition is that half the world's population, three billion people, you know, that's access to energy. And people die from that. You know, you know, hundreds of thousands of people die from that every year. Uh, household air pollution, they call it. It's, there's wood smoke is very toxic. You know, there's, there's, there's three billion people, uh, and that's how they cook their food. There's, over one billion people that have no access to electricity still. You know, so we, we're in the modern age. It doesn't seem that modern to me. And of course, the side effects of all of this are not just climate change, they're massive health issues. It's something like in Southeast Asia, 800,000 people die every year from air pollution. Um, you know, this is, this is particulate matter coming out of coal-fired power stations, coming out of diesel exhausts, and basically poisoning people en masse. Um, and funnily enough, just today, Delhi woke up, this is today, Delhi woke up to a blanket of choking smog this morning because of uh, farmers burning off, um, you know, crop residues, and it all blowing into Delhi, combined with a whole load of coal-fired power stations. You know, so... Not only is it bad for the planet, it's bad for the, for the humans that are trying to use it as well. And it's really, really inefficient. But hey, it's changing. It is changing. And just the last thing, the last thing. Now, having been in the renewables industry for 20 years, I've, I've had a lot of times of being bashed for, well, renewables just want subsidies and they only work because of subsidies. Fortunately, that's a changing picture. But the thing that's come to light is actually fossil fuel industries get three times the subsidy annually that, that the renewable energy industries get. So five trillion a year, they estimate, is coming directly out of public funds into the coffers of fossil fuel companies. But hey, it's all gonna change. And partly because of this agreement in Paris two years ago, and our delega the delegates from all, it's 200 countries are in bond today, um, working on the next steps of the, you know, the getting into the detail of how we deliver the, on, the, on this agreement of to, to aim for one and a half degrees warming. Um, uh, it, 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 the, there's no doubt about it. It's, an it's a momentous achievement, what was done in Paris. And I, I had the fortune and the luck to go there. I actually was there for a little bit, for a couple of days, and it was really nice to be part of it. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's the biggest or most complex bit of diplomacy that's ever been achieved. And yes, it's not perfect, but it's a huge step forwards. And yes, maybe America are going to pull out, but actually I think they're going to be the only country that aren't in it. Apparently I heard today that Syria are about to sign to ratify it themselves and they were the last one missing sort of thing. So it, it, it's, it's a huge step forward. It does... Oh, oh yeah, that's the one I'm after. It, it basically sets some parameters. And if we're going to hit the one and a half degree, two degree warming target, you know, there's only so much carbon we can put into the atmosphere. Now, the big bubble is what's available to us right now from what we know, oil and gas reserves that are there already. The small bubble is what we can burn. So if you think about the value of the stock market, if you think about all the companies that own those resources, that make up the pension funds and everything else, you're going to knock probably four-fifths of, of their value off in this process. That, to me, is the biggest challenge we face here in that... Uh, you know, business as usual, wants to continue, uh, and we need to come up with an alternative. So that's my first section. I'll leave you a nice image in, uh, of me in a tree again. 
But um, yeah, for me, it's been a huge journey of despair, really. Starting off with despair and thinking, what can I do? I'll put my body in front of a bulldozer. To one of feeling like, actually, there's something really interesting happening here now. And, and we do have an opportunity. And th the next bit of this talk is going to be about, ab about that opportunity. But maybe you could just spend a couple of minutes, chat to someone next to you. I don't know, tell them what you feel about all that, what you, uh, when you first came across climate change, whatever it is, and I'll just collect a few, a few thoughts from you in a couple of minutes' time. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to, uh, there's some really good points there. Capitalism, it, well, it actually can be a force for good as well as for, as well as for destruction. It depends what, what ethics you put around it. You know, it could be serving local communities rather than serving multinational, you know, paradise papers, investors. Um, I think, it, you know, the politicians will never be able to do this on their own. There needs to be grassroots movements as well. And, and it's it's about the meeting of that, you know. So, I think there's a there's a there's a whole load of different issues that aren't solved, and th this is why you know loads of people need to get engaged with this issue, and they need to do it in a positive way. And and there is an opportunity. Sorry. Sam, then what do we make of the biggest nation on earth being headed by Donald Trump just pulling away? What do we call him? You, all of this? I think we call that a failure of democracy. You know, I think we call it a failure of democracy, yeah, and, and, and that does happen. Yeah, but I mean, drive. but look at all the cities, look at all the, you know, California is the, actually the biggest economy in the world. California are not pulling out of, of, of the Paris Accord. You know, in fact, they're redoubling their efforts. You know what I mean? So I, I think, yes, it's an issue, but there's, there's, there's different, there, there's different uh, sort of aspects to that story. Well, they are. They are. That's what politicians do. But at the end of the day, we do need to have action, don't we? And we yeah. need to actually change things. So let's talk about transformation. So sometimes transformations can be very rapid. You know, spot the car, spot the horse. You know, you're looking 15 years, you went from everyone having a horse and cart to everyone having a car in some areas, you know. Now, this is the next story. So we're moving from that big centralised power station model where... I own the power station and I charge you for it, you're at the end of the pipe, to this, a distributed model where, you know, you have a generator, I, I buy some of your power, you have a, a heat generator, you heat my home, you know, there, there's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a much more complex model, um, but it's a much more localised model and it's a much more human scale model and fundamentally it's a model that's in balance with nature. You know, this is possible, it's already been done basically. So we're moving from big centralised power stations that effectively suck money and other good stuff out of communities to, to stuff that can actually keep money circulating locally, can take, for instance, wastes and turn them into energy. You know, so that's what we're moving to. There's a whole load of technologies that can make that happen. But for me, the technology is not the important bit. The important bit is the humans and how they structure themselves within it. Uh, and, and that's really what gets me excited. And it's sort of what I'm going to be talking about in these next two bits. Well, this first bit, so I'm going to talk about um, just the crazy stats of what's going on in the energy industry, and particularly around renewables and around oil and gas, because it, it really is like a re revolutionary moment. But I, always, I love putting this up because it just makes people think. So the little green dots, not the red lines around them, if we wanted to power the whole world in 2030 with solar panels, we just make those little green dots out of solar panels and that would power the entire world. Now, I don't propose we do that because it would be a bit mad trying to power Europe all off uh, something sat in uh, Egypt or wherever it is. You know, we can spread that out across the world, across existing buildings, all that sort of stuff, but it gives you a metric for how we would power the world just on solar panels. Now, again, I don't propose we do that. There's loads of different technologies we can use, but you know, it's that simple, folks. Uh, the lovely thing about renewables is they, uh, uh, they're, they're sort of modular. They, they start, you know hand-sized. So, you know, this is a great story about um, solar-powered suitcases in Nepal helping babies to be born in the light rather than uh, die in the dark. So, you know, you can start with something that size 
or you can go this size, you know, massive solar farm in the desert. The same with wind, you know, giant offshore wind turbines that, um, you know, probably one rotation powers a house for a year. You know, it's, it's, they're massive, they're massive. To, to this guy, is in Malawi, William Wank, Kankawamba, I think his name is, great book, the, the Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. It's a really lovely book if you, if you want to look him up. Uh, he's gone on to do all sorts of amazing things, but um, he was uneducated. He went to the dump and found these bits of stuff and managed to make himself a wind turbine that created light. And it was the first light for miles around. You know, it works on a small scale. It works on a huge scale. It works in industrial nations. It works in, in, in rural communities, basically. <coughs> and yes, there was already 100% renewable nations. So Iceland, this is 2012, they were already 100% renewable. So they're 100% renewable for electricity. They're about 90% renewable for heat. It's only getting on and off the island that basically they use fossil fuels for at this moment. And I'm sure they could change that if we move to hydrogen. Um, now they're, they're blessed, yes, they've got some geothermal, they've got lots of hydro, but the funny thing is, everywhere you go, you've got some different resource. You know, if you're in Africa, you've got sun. If you're up here, you've got water and you've got wind, you know. So, so there's, there's all sorts of different ways to harness these things. So Costa Rica, they were 99.5%, something like that, renewable for electricity for about the last two years. You know, another, another nation that's basically done it. Norway. 100% renewable for electricity. Um, not quite there for heat, but you know, well, well on the way, basically. And then across Europe, I'm gonna just read you some stats. So this is Europe, I think it was last weekend, actually. Um, so yeah, 28th of October, Europe provided a quarter of electricity's electricity demand. Wind provided a quarter of Europe's electricity demand. Denmark, 109%. So what they end up doing, Denmark make far too much electricity out of wind turbines. They've got cables to other nations. They just sell the power to other people. Uh, Germany, 61%. Portugal, 44%. Ireland, 34%. Austria, 33%. Spain, 31%. And the UK, 29% of their electricity from, from renewables on that day. You know, this is happening, basically. This is happening. Now, I love these crazy graphs. of So that, that was Denmark. The, don't worry too much about it. It's a bit techy, but I am a bit of a techy person. The, the red line is the consumption, basically. The, 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 the sort of dark blue bit at the bottom is wind turbines. That's all you need to know. Most of their electricity was coming from wind turbines. And the same with Germany. This is the month of, of September. So everything below those yellow peaks is renewable. And again, the red line, the pink line, is their consumption. So you can see some days they were getting monstrous amounts of it, right? So this, this, this is the, the yellow is the solar on their grid. Huge amounts of energy coming just from a few solar panels on people's roofs. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? And you can see, funnily enough, the way that the grid goes, you get these peaks of consumption during the day and it goes, it goes sort of quiet again at night time. Oh, what a surprise. That's what solar does. So suddenly, you, you're getting... This, this bit is the expensive bit to generate, and suddenly solar's coming in and generating it very cheaply. And what was the effect? Oh, Germany starts to have to pay people to use electricity. Because the, the wholesale price of electricity is coming down because they've got so much renewable energy on their grid, and that messes up the whole business, I'm afraid. So this, this is the scale of the transformation. This is something my, the charity I'm chairman of put together. It's wind dial. So this was last night as I was putting this presentation together. 23% of the, of the UK's power was coming from wind turbines alone. Exactly, exactly. Well, and the bad thing is, last year the UK was 25% renewable for electricity. This year it will be 30. Now, if you run a utility business, you must be going, oh my God, what is coming? Because they don't own half this stuff. I'll come on to that later. And it's not just countries, sorry about the, the quality of that. That's an advert that Apple put in a UK paper. There are some ideas we want every company to, to copy. They bought themselves a solar farm. And well, lo and behold, some did. <laughs> Google, they're 100% renewable already. 
Now, data centers use something like 2% of world electricity demand. Google, you can use them without too much worry about climate change, at least. Maybe a few other issues about what your data is doing and where it's going. But in terms of their climate impact, hey, they're 100% renewable. So that's. And they did that in five years. In five years from nothing. Now, that's the speed this transformation can go. So, why is this going on? Well, this for me is the key graph. Solar, well, I bought my first solar panel uh, in about 1994, um, and it was, a, it was an 80-watt panel. It was quite large, and it was about 800 pounds. Now I can buy a 300-watt panel for about 100 pounds. You know? so, so the cost of solar has come down dramatically. And then the deployment has skyrocketed, basically. And again, these figures are out of date. So last year, well, in fact, solar power doubled last year in terms of its deployed capacity, just in one year. So it went from 60 megs to 120 in one year. Now, again, if you're running a utility business anywhere in the world, this is going to be driving you crazy. Because the thing with solar is, yeah, the massive plants the big utilities can get involved with but, you know, so, for instance, right now I run nearly half a gigawatt of solar across the UK. So over the summer, there are some days when solar was doing 25% of the UK's power and the plants I was running were probably doing about 1.5% of the UK's power. Just out of these, you know, there's me and my team of 20 guys running 1.5% of the UK's power out of, you know, a bunch of solar panels in fields. Now, none of them are owned by the utilities. They're all owned by individuals and you know, investment houses and all sorts of new actors who are coming into this space. So it's a bit like the Wild West right now, the energy industry. All sorts of people piling in. It's quite exciting. So yeah, 50% growth. You can see this, it's, it's, it's the opposite curve to, the, to, to, to you know, it's like the climate change curve in many ways, a sort of hockey stick. That's what renewables are doing right now. They are going exponential and they're doing it because of cost. Now again, this is another one from today. Now, had I not seen this headline today, I would have had a, a slide up from Saudi Arabia, where they had the, or was, it, or was it Dubai, where they had the lowest auction about three months ago. Basically, so they're building this solar park in Chile. Uh, they're providing power at 21 US dollars per megawatt hour. Now, wholesale price in the UK is probably 50 pounds, so, you know, 60, 70 dollars per megawatt hour. This isn't just cheap electricity. This is the cheapest electricity from any source ever. You know, not just from, you know, this isn't just a renewables record. This is like the cheapest power anywhere ever, and it's from solar panels. And, and that's, that is the real driver. You know, so the investors have gone, well, hang on a minute. You know, I stick, well, 100 million into a solar park. It's a 25-year investment. I can get a six, seven, eight percent return over 25 years, pretty much guaranteed, because you guys need the energy. That is what's driving the change right now. I mean, similar story for wind, you know, high, high installation costs, dropping, dropping, dropping. Now, I should say, with solar, we have the German people to thank in that they created something called a feeding tariff, which basically drove the uptake of, of solar across Germany, and it, it, it dropped the cost. They did the hard bit, and then the Chinese came in with mass production, invested an absolute fortune in building huge factories, and boom, here we are. A similar thing with, with wind, and that was the Danish. The Danish built loads of wind turbines across their, across their land. If you go and drive across Denmark, it's a great game to play. Spot the wind turbine, they are absolutely everywhere. In about half an hour, you've completely lost count. Um, and there's small ones, big ones. Some are owned by farmers. Some are you know, big industrial ones. Some are community ones. Um, but yeah, basically they've pump primed the, the, the world for, for, for wind turbines. And now onshore wind, offshore wind, sorry, onshore wind is already the cheapest form of electricity in the UK. Now onshore wind's got there as well. And the impact. So we had earlier this year, in April this year, we had the first day in the UK where we generated electricity without using coal since about the 1800s. That is a sign a big sign that things are changing. In fact, coal use in the UK has dropped dramatically, and I think you'll see coal power stations completely gone within the next couple of years. Um, 
a 52% drop in like two years or something. It's crazy, crazy. And that's not just happening in the UK, that's happening in China. So China just scrapped 130 coal plants that they were gonna be building. Yeah, because when I stand up and talk to people about climate change, I normally get someone who stands up and goes, it's all really nice, mate, but you know, what about China? And now I can go, well, that's what about China. In fact, China installed, uh, they, they, they installed a wind turbine every hour in 2016. Uh, and around the world, it was half a million solar panels were installed every day in 2016. You know, it's, it's crazy numbers going on, but China are really at the front of it. So yeah, again, this is not just happening in China, it's in America. You know, Trump may want to bring back coal, but all the coal companies are bankrupt. So the chance of him doing that is pretty slim. You know, it's it, politics going completely the wrong way. And, and then the whole oil and gas industry in general, you know, fracking has been this big salvation in America. It's been this amazing story of, you know, success allegedly um, from some camps and terrible destruction from others. Um, the truth of it is though, that all of the oil and gas companies, I think I, I heard the term, the, the term that they're, they're, um, they're binging on debt. So basically they can't afford to run themselves. They're having to borrow more money to explore to get more reserves, even though we know they can't burn those reserves because of the Paris deal. You know, so it, it's a house of cards, really. Uh, wait, a three, di three trillion debt mountain that they've generated <coughs> to keep their operations going. Now, now your old uh, sweet oil wells in Saudi Arabia, they had like a decay rate of 5%, so 5% re reduction in production. Your fracking wells is 90%, so they have to keep drilling, and that costs a lot of money. Um, so fracking will never replace that stuff. So yeah, it's the juxtaposition basically. And, and so you, then you've got oil majors doing even more extreme things. This is, uh, is it, it was Shell into the Arctic. They really balls it up. They had their, their rig up on the beach. Um, they, they decided to cancel their efforts. It cost them something like 7 billion just to have a go and get it wrong. You know, so it's just a matter of time, I think, before one of these big oil majors goes down and certainly in the utility sector you're already there now, this is a headline from the US in the US you've got lots of companies out there selling or not so, you know, basically giving people solar panels uh, and supplying them with the electricity at a knockdown price it's like well you can have green electricity and it's cheaper and you don't have to put any capital cost in and they're just storming across certain states and completely destroying the monopoly utilities um, but this of course has happened right the way across Europe. In, in Europe, we have six utilities, uh, the big four, the big six, as we call them in the UK, the big four are across continental Europe. They've all had this problem where actually their businesses don't add up anymore because of renewables. Because some days, for substantial periods of the year, the wholesale price of electricity is going negative. You know, they're sat there with a big uh, capital investment in a power station and they can't service the debt. They can't service that investment. So then you get a story like this. E.ON, big multi, you know, multinational utility, has decided to split its business in two, i.e. one bit's mashed and we want to get rid of it, stranded assets. That's the generators. They've decided to spinning off power plants to focus on renewables and energy services. You know, that's them going, oh Christ, we've got a problem. You know, their businesses don't work anymore. And it's the same for RWE, it's the same for all the utilities. And there are not many that have actually thought this through and jumped, but there is one. Now, a month ago, I would have been calling them Dong Energy, which stood for Danish Oil and Natural Gas. Now, actually, in the last six months, they've sold all of their oil and natural gas, and they are the world's biggest wind offshore wind turbine company, and they've rebranded re themselves as Orsted. And, you know, again, they, their, their wind farm is cheaper than a gas plant. Their offshore wind farm is cheaper than a gas plant. You know, so they're ahead of the curve. Uh, but there are not many of them like that. But what's going on with money? So money is pouring into this sector. Um, in the UK, we went, in five years, we went from nothing to 12 gigawatts of solar. That's probably like 15 billion pounds worth of investment in five years, something like that, possibly even more. The portfolio I manage is probably like eight, nine hundred million pounds worth of solar. 
You know, that's the sort of levels of cash that's going in. Now, it has dipped in some of the years, but actually because the cost of these technologies has dr reduced dramatically, the, the, the sort of install capacity has actually still gone up all through that period. So amazing amounts of money are flowing, are flowing this way. And you know, the forecast is fossil fuel investment dropping and clean energy investment accelerating away. And I think it's very likely that that's going to happen having seen what I've seen. You know, 20 years ago when I bought my first solar panel, 18 years ago, whenever it was, when I built my first little solar rig from a book, I had no idea that this is where it would lead. You know, that we would potentially be filling fields with solar panels to power the nation. It's like, wow, it's wild. And I've been on the, on the ride, you know. And talking about being on rides, obviously what I haven't mentioned here is storage. Um, you know, this is another great story of, you know, of transformation. Tesla Motors, Elon Musk, or Tesla Energy now, as he is. Um, you know, this guy was an internet entrepreneur who decided to start an electric car company. Who, you know, I, I remember there's some great quote from the sort of CEO of G G GM who was like, hang on a minute, this guy, he's like an internet guy, and he's done what you told me couldn't be done for another 15 years. How has he done that? You know, this is ridiculous. But basically, he, he's taken batteries out of computers and, and turn them into cars um, with massive success. The capex, the sort of market cap of, of Tesla is bigger than like GM. You know, that company's worth more, even though it only produces like a few thousand cars a year in, in relation to its, its counterparts than the, than, than the existing incumbents. And how's he done it? Partly by being completely crazy and ballsy and doing things like this. This, this factory he's building in Nevada, it's nearly finished. It's called the Gigafactory. So he needs a lot of lithium-ion batteries to run his cars and everything else that he's doing. Um, uh, and so he decided to build a factory. The, that factory isn't just like another little, little, little lithium-ion factory. It doubles global production in one factory. So it's, it's producing more than all the other lithium-ion factories in the world. You know, it's not just like a little step change. It's pff, massive because what he's focused on is getting that huge cost reduction curve. And I haven't got one of those curves to show you, but you know, there are similar cost reduction curves for lithium ion as there were for, for solar. And I think you know, you, 10 years, people are talking about you know, uh, in sort of developed nations that you know, people trying to get rid of cars that are diesel, get rid of cars that are petrol because they're not worth anything anymore because everyone wants an electric car. And I think it's, you know, there's a good chance that's gonna come. But this whole journey, renewables taking off, you know, it's not been without its uh, challenges. So, you know, I, I, I gave up protesting. I was like, no, I actually want to say yes to something. I don't want to, like, stand on the barricades anymore. I want to, like, you know, say yes and take people with me. So I actually retrained as a plumber and an electrician so I could uh, work out how to install solar. And then I grew a company from me to a team of 100 people all across the UK, um, uh, some, week, some, some months we do like 100 houses, you know, sort of eco makeover on them. And, um, and then, you know, I ended up having to close the company about three years ago, two, two, three years ago, because of all this sort of stuff. Basically, you know, the incumbents know what's coming and they're doing their damnedest to stop it. Um, so whenever the government puts in a favourable law for renewables, they'll battle, battle to get it removed. So, so in this case, we had a situation where I was chairing the trade body that represents the, the solar sector. Um, and we got this notice that we were, we were basically going to be shut down uh, in sort of five weeks' time. That was it. It's over sort of thing. So we went into full campaign. Mode. This is me on the, on the sort of main, main news channel um, defending the industry. And we, we took the government to the court high court three times and won three times to basically keep the industry alive. But it's empiric victories often when you're fighting with uh, huge systems, basically. But, you know, it's, it's a crazy disruptive, disruptive thing that's going on. The incumbents are trying to stop it. And then you get people like Tesla who come in who just determined to make it happen. You know, and, and, and they're very much the poster boy in some ways at this point. For, for the movement, but um, you know, there's loads of different companies out there doing really interesting stuff and, and, and making this change happen. So that is the next section. And I'll give you, again, just a few minutes just to reflect. I'm probably going way over on time.
about, you know, that. And I'll, we'll talk about opportunity in a moment. Yeah. <laughs> nuclear. Well, nuclear, it's a bit of a dead one as far as I'm concerned. But uh, um, yeah, nuclear's, no, well, let's face it, the nuclear industry was born from weapons manufacturing. Now, although the first nuclear, you know, sort of nuclear power station to produce electricity in the UK uh, was in the UK, um, it was actually just being dressed up because what they were doing was producing fissile material for bombs. Um, yes, they've gone on to develop you know, terrestrial nuclear power stations to make electricity, but they've always been so massively heavily subsidized. I, mean, I took that out. I often talk about this subject. But obviously, France has got huge nuclear power stations, 70% of their electricity, but let's face it, we have no solution for nuclear waste. Um, and you know, you've got Chernobyl and Fukushima that are sort of weeping wounds, basically. Um, the, the estimated cost to take down the UK power stations, not to store the waste, is 80 to 220 billion pounds. And we as taxpayers are going to foot that bill. Yeah, I mean, you're doing it in Germany. Cause I don't know, I'll, maybe I should jump onto this. So this is about opportunity. And, and obviously, there's a massive opportunity in this whole subject, whether you're a business person, whether you're a community activist, whether you're a, you know, you were a councillor or whatever, wherever you sit, there's an opportunity with renewable energy right now, on your own home, in your village, whatever. And, and I guess for me, there's, there's a lovely um, bringing together of agendas. You know, so if you build a power station that's owned by your community, you create a new commons, you create a new sort of community bank, you also get rid of C, you know, CO2 emissions and potentially you solve fuel poverty in the process. You know, so there's this brilliant win, 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 win story to come out of this potentially. And I, now I'm gonna tell you a few stories about where people have done that. And I'll start with me. So um, about 10 years ago, I, well in fact, 20 years ago, I tried to start a community owned energy company and people just thought I was completely mad. I said, you can't just start an energy company. What are you talking about? It's ridiculous. 10 years later, um, I don't know if you've heard of the transition movement. Um, so transition movements around people coming together around peak oil, climate change, and you know, becoming, coming back into balance. It's a big global movement now. It started in a town called Totnes. The second town was my town, Lewis. Um, and suddenly there was this big fervor of people in my town going, well, we've got to do something about this. And, and they said, right, well, we'll start a group about energy. And I, and they, oh, Howard, would you come along? You know quite a bit about this. And so we sat, I sat in this room finally with all these people from my town and they, they said, well, why don't we just build a windmill on the hill? That could power the whole town. And I'm like, that is a great idea. But sadly, to do that, we probably need to throw away a quarter of a million pounds just on the planning fees alone. Uh, and so that sort of put them off. But, but what came out of it was there was an appetite from people to actually try and do something different. So this was the launch of our, of our energy company. Now... It's a very small energy company. We, basically, what we, what we decided to do was to build a small solar power station on a, on a building at the heart of our community. It was the local brewery. We thought cold beer was you know, the route in to the population. So keeping the beer cold was a very important public service that we were gonna provide. Um, and, and so we started developing this project over the course of a year. And, and, and then when we came to actually be just about ready to launch, the government decided that they were going to change all the rules around this, which would destroy our project. So suddenly we had this 300 people in the town hall and we had five weeks to raise the £350,000 that we needed to build a project, as well as to get it built. Um, so it was suddenly this crazy hair-raising moment. And to make it even worse, I went up... I was just about to go on stage to sort of make my presentation and I bent down and ripped my trousers completely open. <laughs> so I had to stand up in front of my whole town <laughs> and do a presentation with my back very much to the wall. But hey, amazingly, we raised the money and we got the project built. And that was the first, the first one. And we've gone on to build a, a chunk more. We're actually just about to launch two more share offers 
to do with loads more schools um, and also to heat a load of leisure centres in our, in our community as well. The model being, we're going to build something, it's going to make electricity, we're going to sell that electricity and we're going to get a, a feed-in tariff for that electricity. And with the money we get in, we can pay you, Mr Investor, a return on your investment. That's the sort of basic business model. Now, obviously, commercial people are doing that all the time, but most communities have never thought of doing something like that. Um, you, you were able to buy a share in the company, uh, one share, one vote. We'd have an AGM every year where people come together and they hear about progress and the fact that the seagull dropped a, dropped a stone on one of the panels and broke it and all that sort of stuff, all the good nitty-gritty of running this thing. But, yeah, so, you know, we had this amazing project that... that you know, it's a very small thing. It probably only powers less than 100 houses. But it was a first step to show that a community could come together to structure themselves with a legal entity that they could get investment in and make it happen. Um, we, we then went on to mentor loads of other companies across, across the South. Um, and, and I had the, the funny occasion of doing a talk, not too dissimilar to this one, in, in, um, in Canada, about six months after we'd done this, or a year after maybe, and, um, and I saw there was a, you know, a lecture on community energy. And I was like, oh, wow, it's happening here. Brilliant. And I went to this lecture thinking, great, I can't wait to hear what they're doing. And I sat in the back, you know, and the first speaker stood up and said, well, yeah, well, you know, we came across this company in England. And she held up <laughs> the prospectus for my company from Lewis. And they said, we like their ideas so much, we decided to do it here. And, and that's been my experience, that these ideas... I said, I, that was me, that was me. <laughs> I nearly fell off my chair, is what I did. But yeah, I was just, I was amazed that ideas, that good ideas, they just spread, you know. And for me, I, I first heard about this from Germany. So this, this is a company um, called EWS Schoenhau. It's an amazing story. So these guys were under the, they were under the fallout cloud, cloud from the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. They were right under it. And, and basically, the authorities said to them, stay inside, keep your windows closed, and don't eat the greens from your garden, and don't drink any milk. And then after three weeks, it was all quiet, and everything was fine. And now, there was one guy in the community who was a doctor. He said, well, hang on a minute, this, this is not all fine. And they started going out and finding, actually, that the, the, the sand in the kids' play park was irradiated, and you know, there was much more issues. And they said, actually, we don't want to be part of this nuclear thing anymore. And they came together, basically, to try and figure a way out of it. First of all, they ran like an energy saving contest and, and, and they were met with, you know, sort of very, a lot of negativity from the local utility, basically, who said, oh, no, no, we don't want to help you. We're not interested. We're not interested. In the end, it, it, there was this funny occurrence where the, the, the local grid was uh, sort of up for tender so a new company could come in and they decided to put a company together and, and, and to, to bid to win this, this grid to run it as a community. Um, and basically, it took them 10 years of fighting and legal battles and referendums and all sorts of stuff. And then they bought the grid and they did it as a community. Um, people from all over the country supported them. Now, today, they supply 150,000 people across Germany with 100% renewable electricity, amongst other things. You know, so to me, it's an amazing story of transformation, how communities can come together and do something really good, you know. And, in, in many ways, they were like the, the sort of poster child in Germany, but there are 900 companies like this in Germany now. You know, active, it's an active scene, there's lots of, you know, and some of them are council owned, and some of them are just local communities, some have got businesses involved, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a really vibrant and rich space, with lots of different actors, but fundamentally with, you know, the benefit coming back to the communities, because let's face it, at the moment, the pure, pure profit model of running energy doesn't work, you know, because we're just here to make profit and bugger the consequences of the planet. Actually, this, this provision, you know, everyone should have access to electricity. You know, this is a public service in some way, and it should be done with that spirit in mind, you know. So when they make profit, they invest it back in making the system better, making the bills cheaper, building more generation, whatever it is that's needed, campaigning for change, you know. So it's a, it's a great story. Um, one of the, one of the um, in fact, this woman, Eva, I, I, I met her and interviewed her when I was, because I, I interviewed loads of really cool people when I was writing my book, and, and she was saying, we, 
we, um, we, we were taking the children from the Chernobyl area for respite. And one year, you know, one of the children didn't come. And we were like, well, where's that child? And, um, and she died, basically, from you know, a, a related illness to, to the, to, to the uh, radiation exposure. And, and, and she said, at that moment, we realized that we couldn't carry on. Because you know, these children, they were our children. And we had to take action. And I, I think that you know, the, what we're faced with, with at this point is it's a moral thing. You know, this isn't just about business and money. And if we don't act, you know, what do we say to our children? That's, that's the crux of it. But anyway, so they did. And actually, the amazing thing about Germany is that the utilities, the big utilities, they only own that bit, 5% of all the renewable generation that's been built. And you've got this amazing splurge of different participants in the energy market now. So it's, there's me, big utility, with my big power station, and you all have to buy from me. Suddenly, you go to this. Boom. 35% of the renewables are owned by individuals. They're all power stations now. Oh, 11% is owned by farmers. They're all power stations. That's what's going to come, is this diverse energy sector where farmers are part of it, where municipalities are part of it. And it's exciting. You know, this, is, this is the new world we're forging, basically. And Germany have been leading that. Another quick story is from this island called Samso, which is in Denmark. It's in, in the Baltic Sea. So in 98, there was a sort of uh, uh, nice chap who was very well-meaning who moved to Samso with a mission to think about how they could power the island with renewables. At, the, at that time, it had, uh, they were importing a lot of diesel and they had a submarine cable that wasn't really big enough. And, you know, no one really cared about that sort of stuff and in 10 years they were net positive so they made more energy on the island than they needed um, and he talks about how you know he stood up at the town hall and said i've got this great idea we're going to make all of our energy from renewables isn't it great and they all said everyone nodded and clapped and they all left and they never came back and he started wandering around going well, you like my idea, don't you? Why, 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 why aren't we getting on with it? You know, and he started walking around and, and, and he said, he said oh, well, I went to the farm and I said, look, we, for, for the heating, we're going to need biomass. We're going to need this much growing. Could you grow it for us? Oh, yeah, yeah, I could do that. Oh, how much is that going to make a year? And to the, to the plumbers, he said, now we're going to need these district heating pipes laying. Could you do that? And, and after a couple of years of going around talking to people about how they would have a part in this story, then he went to the town hall and said, now, this is what we're planning to do. Who thinks it's a good idea? First of all, the farmer said, I think it's an excellent idea. I'm very happy to grow the, the biomass feedstock for the plant to heat the town. And, you know, suddenly when people saw themselves in the story, they made it happen. The transformation in 10 years, um, it's totally possible. So they used wind. And this, some of it's owned by commercial companies. Some of it was owned by uh, the community themselves. Uh, they also used uh, district heating using solar thermal and uh, biomass. Um, and in Denmark, actually, over the last 30 years, they've gone from no district heating schemes to 60 to, f 60 to 70 percent of the population is served by a district heating scheme, which is inherently more efficient. Um, and, and now, when most of them are owned by uh, energy guilds, so they're owned cooperatively, effectively, across the whole town. And when they're repairing them, when the boilers need changing, they've, they've worked out that if they stick a field full of solar thermal panels that make heat. That's the cheapest way to make heat for their community. And some of these have got what's called interseasonal storage. So underneath here, there's a big pit full of water with insulation on the top of it. And they run all the heat into that in the summer. And in the winter, they run it out around the town. This is some really in innovative stuff going on, but very, very cheap to run, basically. Even in America, we despair at Mr. Trump for many, many reasons, not least of which pulling out of Paris. But... You know, actually, uh, this is um, uh, Burlington, Vermont, 100% renewable for electricity already. And there's loads of cities, there's loads of states that have pledged to go 100% renewable by 2030 or whatever, and lots of them are well on the way. Bangladesh. So there's already, I, I would get really excited in the UK saying, we've already got half a million solar homes. Do you know what, Bangladesh, they've already got four million solar homes. And this was driven by one company, Gramin Shakti, which was um, uh, microcredit, basically. So they combined innovative financing with solar technology. 
And the lovely thing about this story is that most of those systems were sold by female solar entrepreneurs. And they've got networks of training centers all over the, all over the country where they train the women to go out and sell. And the transformation to these people's lives that a small solar home system can have is phenomenal. Um, and not least of which when they're using kerosene. So kerosene is something like 300 million people in sub-Saharan Africa, that's their access to light. Um, I don't know if you've ever, it's fun you know, for us in the West when you're camping to have a kerosene light, but if you have to live with one, it's not fun at all. Um, they're dangerous, they're really bad for your health. Um, I, I read some report from South Africa, the highest, highest um, incidence of toddler death and injury is related to kerosene lamps being kicked over. And hey, then you bring in a $5 solar light. Not only does it pay for itself potentially in about five weeks, then you've got like five years of free light. It's totally transformative. Now, $5 solar lights are spreading across Africa not fast enough. You know, the, the amount of um, money and, and you know, positive impacts it has, it should be spreading as fast, faster than it is. Um, you know, if you think about the mobile phone, there's more people using internet banking on mobile phones or mobile banking on mobile phones in Kenya than there are in the UK. You know, so something like that. It's totally crossed over. And I think, I think solar will get there. I don't know why it's not quite there yet. I mean, in Kenya, it, it's, you know, th these things are really going for it. Um, I have a friend who sold like two million of them last year in Kenya. But um, in many other countries, they're not there yet. And, and the next step on, really, for me, is the whole microgrid. You know, so instead of, let's, instead of building a big power station and running lines to these remote villages, let's build them a little independent microgrid. So as a classic one, here's a, a company in uh, Haiti, you know, uh, uh, still recovering from, from the disasters there. And there's a startup from America that's gone out to Haiti, and they're just, they're just building grids, mini grids with solar, um, you know, just serving the local population. And actually, that, that's a profitable business. You know, so I think that's a business that is going to go mad across the world, and there are companies that are set up specifically focused to target that. I guess for me, one of the key things about this is it doesn't matter where you're from. Generally, people want this stuff. Now, one of the projects I was involved with was um, a company called Repower London, and this was Brixton Energy. This was the first inner city uh, community energy project. Um, the guys that put, put this one together, they spent two years knocking on this tower block. It's, a, it's like one of the roughest tower blocks in London, you know, multiple deprivation, lots of people who've never worked, lots of you know, drug issues, really tough place basically. They spent two years knocking on doors going, hi, we're thinking about doing this energy company. And th then what they did was they trained some of the young people in how to insulate the buildings. <coughs> and slowly, slowly they won the trust. And, and then when it came to hey, and actually, you know what we want to do? We want to build a power station on the roof of the block and you can all invest in it. Now, these people, a lot of them didn't even have bank accounts. 90% of the money for that system came from the people in the block because when they were asked if they'd like to be part of it, actually, they would. Just no one had ever asked them before. You know, so it's amazing. And, and the same in, in the US. There was a, um, a power provider launching green power in a, you know, sort of in a rich middle class area, and then they were going to launch it in a, in a, in a, in a uh, um, Marin County Green Energy, this, this, this is a company, you know. In the rich middle class area, they thought, oh, we'll get the best uptake. Actually, in the poorer area, that's where they got the best uptake of people taking 100% green energy, even though it's more expensive. You know, so <laughs> people want this stuff, they're just not being given the opportunity, and that, that in my opinion, is the failure of the green movement, is not actually providing people with a nice easy path to walk along because it's out there basically and I guess so think about a system like that so this this is a power station on the roof of a community that are really poor and it creates money for them and with that money they can do other things you know so for me creating energy companies in your communities is absolutely essential about it's about building robust communities moving forwards you know so you know, the output of this can be many other things depending on what your community needs. So I'm going to read, read something now just to finish up. So I'm here today as a messenger of hope to invite you all to be part of this new story 
the one where we provided clean, locally owned renewable energy for all. It's possible now, and there are so many roles you can play. Yet you could dig deep like me and create a local cooperative energy company in your community, or you could invest in one that's already running. You could bring your skills to one that's trying to get off the ground. It's time to transform our society from one that's literally built on burning the dead remains or the remains of our long dead ancestors to one that's powered by light. And I, I can't underestimate, I think that's going to be such a profound shift from burning dead things to being connected back with the sun. I think it will have a huge impact across many things in our life that we're probably not even aware of. And I'm convinced right now we've got all the technology we need, we've actually got all the money we need, we've got the knowledge we need to organise this shift and make it happen. The revolution is here. And it's not just for, for revolutionaries anymore, it's for everyone. They don't call it power for nothing, and it's time to take it back. Thank you. Howard, I think we have a, a few minutes for uh, five, five minutes.